This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community Matters here. Are live. Welcome to Community Matters on Think Tech. I'm your host, Elizabeth Sartouris. And our show today is called Making Honolulu into a Resilient City. And we're going to talk about the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, <laughs> how the Rockefeller Foundation has stepped up and everyone should know about what it takes to make Honolulu a resilient city. If you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, you can tweet us at thinktech hyphen H hyphen I or call us at 437-2014. Our guest for the show is Joshua Stanbro of uh, Honolulu Hale, who is going to talk about how we can make Honolulu into a resilient city, what it means actually to be a resilient city, and how the Rockefeller Foundation is building 100 such cities around the globe, Honolulu included. Welcome to the show, Josh Stanbro. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. So I am so excited to have you as a guest on the show because I've been very excited about the Rockefeller Foundation choosing 100 cities around the globe to become more resilient uh, against climate disasters, things of that kind, as well as solving their chronic problems. So uh, the CRO position, Chief Resilience Officer, is brand new and is cropping up all over the world in 100 different cities. Right. So tell us a little bit about how this began for Honolulu. Uh, how did we apply? Why did we get chosen? And what does it all mean for us? Sure, yeah, well, it's a really exciting story. Um, uh, so the Rockefeller Foundation actually celebrated their 100th anniversary uh, a few years back, about five years back. Um, and at the time, uh, Judy Rodin, who was the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, she had written a book called The Resilience Dividend that really talked about this concept of resilience, why it was um, important for cities as we sort of head into the 21st century and the challenges we face in the, the, the sort of the new, this new era of climate change, increased technology, um, sort of the uh, global globalification of the um, uh, world economy. And so she posited that as cities became more adaptable to these and were able to sort of bend rather than break in the face of them, um, there would actually be cost savings and significant benefits uh, to cities that adopted some of these principles. So um, what they did for their 100th anniversary is they decided to launch this initiative that would select 100 cities around the globe. Um, they created an organization called 100 Resilient Cities. So it's not actually Rockefeller Foundation, per se, that selects the cities. Rockefeller Foundation um, provides financial support to 100 Resilient Cities, which is a nonprofit that then goes out and, and selects and works with these cities. So um, there were 1,200 cities around the globe that applied for sort of this honor of being selected as one of the 100. Um, and happily, and, and you know, uh, it's a big source of pride for our city, I think, that we got selected out of that 1,200. We were one of the, the 100 um, selected by 100 resilient cities. Um, it's great timing for us. Uh, we were actually selected in the third cohort. So there was the first year, which is about mm, three years ago now, um, there was 33 cities that were selected around the globe. Um, and this is, you know, includes cities like Melbourne, Australia, and um, New York, uh, and, and you know, all around the globe. And then there was a second cohort of 32 cities that were selected, and uh, Honolulu made it in in the third cohort, uh, the final cohort, and where we were one of the final um, 33 cities uh, selected. And that announcement just came um, last year around summertime, and that actually coincided with um, a charter amendment that was on the, the ballot before voters yes. here in Honolulu, um, which asked the voters of Honolulu uh, and the city and county of Honolulu, the island of Oahu, should we have an office dedicated to climate change, sustainability, and resiliency? Right. Um, great turn, you know, uh, results from that election uh, by almost an 18-point margin. The citizens of, of the island said, "Yes, we absolutely need to address I'm sure these we issues." Were both included. <laughs> yeah, I know. I often ask when I go out to crowds, you know, how many voted in the yeah. uh, election, and you know, hopefully you, you voted to support this because. Really, it really puts us on the leading edge. There's not, you know, barely any cities. Lots of lots of folks have sustainability departments. Um, there are these hundred cities that are embracing this concept of resilience with the um, with the support of the Rockefeller uh, folks. 
but very few cities have an office dedicated to climate change, how we adapt to the changes we already see happening around us, and how we mitigate and try to um, reduce our own impacts uh, to, to the problem. Um, so it's a really exciting time in the city. We've got both of these things flowing together, both the creation of the office and the selection of 100 resilient cities, and it's working together um, through these, uh, these activities to really try to make Honolulu more resilient. Right, so you've just come back from a Resilience City, Resilient City Summit, haven't right, you, in right. New York. And as I understand it, there were uh, 80 CROs or 81 CROs there. Uh, and that means all the ones that have been chosen so right. far for the first two court cohorts and coming in now for the third cohort. Mm -hmm. And uh, 500 people in all from all these cities around the globe. So uh, it would be great to, I, I notice they called the CROs senior points of contact that drive the agenda. Yeah. So uh, we're going to get to the agenda by having you talk a little bit about what have the, those cities that were in the first cohort already finished their two-year uh, project sure. to get going and to have mobilized their cities by now. So what were the most important things you took away from that conference? Well, uh, you know, every city is in a different context, and every city is at a different stage in this process. So um, the variety was incredible. Um, there's a, you know, there's folks like New Orleans, who is a city that's in sort of our um, cohort of, of cities that uh, there's sort of these small, smaller groupings out of the hundred, and, and Miami, New Orleans, and Honolulu are part of one of those groupings, which is really. Um, helpful because they're dealing with some of the very same issues of sea level rise and um, sort of water and flooding that, that, that we will deal with. Um, so, you know, a city like New Orleans, they were one of the first to come out with their resilience strategy. Their chief resilience officer um, had served uh, in economic development before. They came out with a plan that Mayor Landro and the city wholeheartedly embraced. And now they're making all of their budgeting decisions in the city based around that resilience idea. So how do we incorporate our, our spending, our capital projects, um, our operations, and how we fund the, the workings of the city based on this lens of how do we make ourselves more resilient? And you know, they had every reason to do that. After Hurricane Katrina, um, they really wanted to release their res resilience strategy on the 10th anniversary of Katrina to show that we are taking this seriously so much so that we're actually orienting our budget around it. And the chief resilience officer there now is the sort of the deputy director and in charge of, of budgeting for the city. Um, so that's one you know, really profound example of how a city can embrace resilience and orient its priorities, its spending priorities around uh, making the city more equitable. Um, their, their new mantra there is instead of living against water, we're gonna live with water. I'm um, trying to redesign mm -hmm. green infrastructure to make sure that you know, they're basically operating as flexibly as possible when they get flooding and, and flooding events. Um, and so it goes from that to cities that just started, just like us. I mean, we are just fresh out of the gate. So um, what new ideas did you get for Honolulu from, uh, from what other people are doing? Because it, it, that's important, all this dialogue around the world, so that each city doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but did you get some good ideas from other CROs uh, who've been through this now about how to proceed here. Yeah, certainly. I mean, yeah. when you look at, um, you know, what Boulder, Colorado is doing around um, looking at where their sort of risks are around heat, that's what they identified as one of the major um, barriers for them to, to being a resilient, livable community was sort of the rising temperature in, in, in their particular location. And um, they used one of the the partners that's available through the 100 Resilient Cities platform to do an analysis of all of the trees in the city, what the shade, where the shade was being cast, and if they were to spend a certain amount of money and maximize those dollars, where would they plant each tree additionally in the city and what type of tree would it be? Wow. So, you know, it's that type of really specific analysis of how do we get the most out of our dollars to provide the most public benefit and quality of life for our citizens. Right. That, you know, as we walk around the streets here in, in downtown Honolulu, you can watch how people actually follow the parts of the sidewalk that have trees shading them, oh, yes. and they void the ones that don't. Um, and so, you know, as we begin to think about what are the, what are the you know, vulnerabilities that we face as a city, and it's, 
it's not just environmental um, stressors. It's not just climate change. A lot of cities have um, thought really carefully about what really is their main vulnerability to um, being able to adapt yeah. and thrive in the face of a shock or a stress. And oftentimes it's an equity issue. It could be an income inequality issue. It could be an affordable housing issue, which we have here in, in spades. Um, and so each city is looking at it in a different lens. And so as we progress through our um, process of doing the resilient strategy, figuring out where our chief vulnerabilities are, we're gonna reach out to each individual city um, and connect with them to say, hey, we're, look, we're facing some of the same issues around affordable housing. How, what have you learned through the resilient, uh, 100 Resilient Cities process that has, has worked for you? Yeah. So we'll be very specific about how we reach out to our partners once we begin identifying the vulnerability. So I hesitate to say, hey, I went to the summit, came back with you know, all these things sure. we're gonna do, um, <laughs> because we're really right at the beginning of the, of the process, which is great. It's a perfect yeah. opportunity for you know, folks to get involved, um, to help inform us of what they think resiliency um, issues are on the table and, and where we should be focusing with this unique opportunity from, from right. the uh, 100 Resilient City yeah. platform. And I know that one of the reasons that we got it was our, our top chronic, pro was solving chronic <laughs> problems and building resilience uh, against disasters and other things. The chronic problem that was on top of the list for Honolulu was of course homelessness, yeah. Not, no surprise to anyone. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm wondering what strategies are we going to, there are a lot of people working on homelessness already yeah. here in the city. Yeah. And so what I'm wondering is, you know, how, how can this project help to consolidate all those efforts and add to them? So we'll see with the, with the, with the, especially with the arena of homelessness, you know, um, Mayor Caldwell and the administration have been really proactive about trying to figure out what are the best solutions to homelessness? I mean, they've been working with Seattle and LA and other cities that are, um, in some cases, I mean, we have the highest per capita homeless yes. in this um, population, but in some of those other cities, the, the problem just by scale is really um, sort of off the charts. And so, you know, the adoption of housing first as a, as a newish policy to make sure that people get housing primarily and then work on issues that are keeping them in a homeless situation. Um, has really been a um, sort of a, a revolutionary approach that clearly um, pays off and mm -hmm. we've seen progress. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a housing office at the... Um, yeah, we, uh, ha we have to take a break for a little sure. bit here. So we'll get back to that topic of homelessness uh, after the break. Um. <laughs> Some say divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. For the cells slide, right also right after the break. Okay, we're coming back to you. Three, two, one. Okay, so we're back. We're talking here about Honolulu as a resilient city with Joshua Stanbro, Chief Resilience Officer, uh, chosen by our city in response to the Rockefeller Foundation with its 100 cities around the whole globe. I'm an evolution biologist by training. And uh, if we could have the slide, I've written an article called A Tale of Cells and Cities. And I uh, would like you to see just one picture of how very much cities resemble cells when you see cities from the air, whether it's by day or by night, you see a central city hub, you see the transportation systems, you see the outlying regions reaching into the countryside and I had hoped that we would get that slide up uh, just so that people can see that cities are living entities. Right. And I am absolutely convinced that cities are going to play a more important political role in the world in the future 
than either nation, national governments or state governments. I think cities are where the connections can be made. We don't have standing armies. We talk to each other peaceably. And that's why I think this 100 resilient cities sharing around the globe is so very important. But my heart is here in Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so homelessness at the top of our list of chronic problems to solve. And you mentioned getting homeless people into homes. And I think several places in the world now have demonstrated that just by housing homeless people, you save money. And that with the right kind of health care, you avoid having people on the street constantly going back to emergent, in and out of emergency rooms, stuff, which is very expensive. Right. So we have to get real about what costs too much money and what doesn't. And that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, so I mean, we can talk about the economics of uh, prevention. I mean, we have about 5,000 homeless people uh, on the island at any one time. Um, it does cost about half as much to do, you know, sort of vouchers to keep people in stable housing um, versus incarceration or, or frequent hospitalization. So it really, it really pays from an economic point of view to put people in houses. And we've got a, we've got a team that's working on that. They're making progress as you see the point in time count sort of level off and, and be, come, begin to come down. Um, but I'd love to get back to your point about the cities. Yeah. Um, you know, in 1800, 10% of the world's population lived in cities. Today, 50% of the world's yes. population lives in cities. In 2050, 75% of the world's right. population is going to live in cities. And so if we get sort of cities right, um, and we, you know, we consider the whole island of Oahu, obviously, yes. this is our jurisdiction. Not everywhere is a city per se, um, but there's infrastructure that goes along with the way that, that you know, we've constructed our, our society. And if we get that infrastructure right, it makes for a whole different level of success for the planet, essentially, because you've got this concentration of people living in these areas. I'll also point out, I mean, um, when we did our agenda setting workshop and we had 100 and 80 almost um, leaders come together to sort of do a very quick assessment of what they saw, thought vulnerabilities were to inform our office and, and moving forward. One of the big sources of pride was um, when the federal administration pulled out of the Paris Agreement, um, within four days, five days, the governor of the state and all four county mayors had proclaimed that we were still in the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And that response from cities and local governments is really what's driving the next generation of leadership out of, out of the United States at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so agreed, I think you know, cities are um, a focus for the work that we are doing, but I think the lessons of the resilience work are far beyond just cities. I think when we look at yes. you know, what's the green infrastructure that we can deploy, how do we lessen our footprint while still remaining the same quality of life, that's, that's a kind of lesson that can go city, right countryside, you know, um, rural, uh, in, in a lot of different areas. And so that's the, that's the sort of stuff that we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Where are the places where we're missing? Where are the gaps in our yeah. current resilience? It could be around homelessness. It could be around, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of these, this climate um, vulnerability that we're showing increasingly. We saw the king tides uh, last month and where, you know, what a postcard from the future, what it's going to look like in terms of our infrastructure. Right. Um, so that's, that's what we're hoping to look at. But we're also hoping that we don't just focus on weaknesses. You know, what makes Hawaii so amazing and special and probably the reason that, that we would live here is that, that social fabric that we experience here, the aloha spirit, um, people looking out for each other, and that the social networks that we seem to have um, a really strong um, these strong relationships that carry us through, you know, when we have the earthquake or we have, you know, these other things that, um, that challenge us, we come together. And that's really the number one tool of resilience for any community. Well, that's right where I want to be about this. You said bringing them together. You know, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with the trees of Honolulu. And uh, <coughs> that was over 100 years ago when the outdoor circle of women mm -hmm. got these two things passed, planting trees up and down the avenues and outlawing outdoor advertising, which is phenomenal. I can look at the night cityscape with no, nothing blinking at me in bright colors and no advertising being thrown at me. That's amazing for a leading tourist capital. 
So I'm all for planting more trees. Mm -hmm. When I first got here, I was doing some furniture shopping and stuff in Kakaako, and I, it was horrible that there were so many areas that were barren with no trees. And I'm frankly devastated by the, the building rate in Kakaako. And I think even if we have no sea level rise, those buildings are going to start falling in on each other. No one has done a combined weight impact study of all the proposed high rises on that fragile coastland, which is landfill on top of a crumbling coral reef. So uh, if we want to be resilient, that's not the way to go. And huge problems we have here. But we, you, you're here to bring the people together to solve these problems. And that's exciting. You know, if, uh, I would love to see, say, tap the students at Chaminade, where I teach and design new courses in the MBA program. They give credit for community service. Those students, if you trained them to really understand the program, could be sent out to teach it in the schools to the teachers. Then the teachers could have all the kids designing ways of solving these problems, and then you give them a lay and put them on a lay low, and none of this costs a cent. So I think involving communities is, is not so hard to do. Um, and that's, have you got any plans for, there are also all these nonprofits here already, probably six right. agencies and nonprofits right. working on fragile coastland and NOAA and all these things, and then Sierra Club, and homelessness projects and stuff, how, how weave those together? <laughs> well, I'm, so I come from the nonprofit community. Yeah. Um, I, uh, many, many years ago, I w worked for the Trust for Public Land. We worked directly with communities to help protect land, cultural sites, recreational mm -hmm. sites that were really important to the community. Um, and then my last position was working at the Hawaii Community Foundation, mm -hmm. where we provided grants to those nonprofits that are doing this great work out in the community. Um, so I see our ultimate success at the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency um, in a partnership mm -hmm. and looking outward from the city to the, the network of nonprofits and community groups that are already doing great work on the ground. Mm -hmm. How do we learn from them? How do we make sure that we incorporate the lessons that they're learning into whatever planning that we do, whatever partnerships we do within the city with our uh, different departments and divisions as we think about how do we design a more not only not only a more resilient infrastructure and a more resilient mm -hmm. city um, and more resilient community, but but how we design that more connected social fabric um, that you're you're talking about. And you know, coming from the nonprofit community, it's yeah. it's not an easy job, right? I mean, organizing yeah. people is always some of the hardest right. work out there, but it's the most essential I to the work we're doing. I think children will be your best ambassadors because <laughs> if they're talking about it over the supper table, then the parents will get involved and everybody will know. Well, I talk it's to my two kids every night about it. So. Great. No, that's exactly where we want to go. I'm really sorry that this brings us to the end of this half hour show. So we've really enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm your host, Elizabeth Satouris, and our guest, uh, has been Joshua Stanbro, Chief, Resilient, Chief Resilience Officer at Honolulu Hale. I hope we'll talk more about this as the project gets further underway. Thanks so much, Joshua. Thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you.